Welcome to the Groundhog Day edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. It's February 2nd, 2012. Of course, the globalists want us to believe there'll be six more cycles in the winter of tyranny. But humanity is waking up. We'll get to that later in the report. Also coming up, Dr. Jerome Corsi will cover a smattering of issues, including an update on the lawsuit challenging Obama's eligibility in the state of Georgia, also money laundering on Wall Street, and a whole lot more. But first in the news... Full body scanners at the Super Bowl in 2012. At least that's what was reported earlier in the day. According to WPRINews.com, reporter Matt Touche said, despite a congressional demand for an investigation into the machines following health concerns, the scanners will be a part of the security set in Indianapolis this weekend, marking the first time the controversial devices have been used for a public sporting event. However, there's been an update, and Homeland Security and TSA have now tweeted that they will not use body scanners. And this reporter, Matt Touche, has revised his statement where he earlier said Lucas Oil Stadium would, uh, told him he'd have to go through the body scanners. Now he claims they are, in fact, only metal detectors. Now, given the fact that the TSA has been caught lying about all kinds of different issues, including promises to stop groping children under 12 and, and that they were going to test the radiation body scanners for their harmful effects, uh, you can't exactly believe them. But as Paul Joseph Watson writes, you can be sure you'll get a full body pat down and a groping if you do attend the Super Bowl. And why is uh, the Football League so involved in Homeland Security's measures? Why do they keep saying there's going to be a threat against sports stadiums? And why do all the FEMA uh, continuity of government exercises always involve rounding up the mass of the population into stadiums? Uh, questions for a different time, but we'll keep an eye on that as they have two-faced statements regarding the upcoming Super Bowl set for this Sunday. Meanwhile, with the economic collapse ensuing, survival is, of course, on everyone's mind. Here's what came to one person's mind. Come with me if you want to live. Come with me if you want to live. Come with me if you want to live. Of course, we're talking about James Cameron, who is now fleeing the U.S. for New Zealand. Now, on the one hand, he is working on a sequel to Avatar there. But on the other hand, many of the wealthy elites have fled the country uh, with the writing on the wall as far as the economic collapse, the possibility of a bio terror attack, and a whole lot more. Cameron's decision fits the trend of wealthy Americans pulling their money out of the country and reinvesting it to buy land in the Southern Hemisphere, escaping spiraling tax rates, and protecting themselves against the potential for widespread social dislocation. Another interesting sign on the wall. Uh, meanwhile, Washington state legis lawmakers are the latest to join a chorus of opposition in the bill for indefinite detention, now introducing a bill challenging the authority of the NDAA. Reps Jason Overstreet, Matt Shea, Vincent Buys, Kerry Condota, and David Taylor introduce HB 2759, the Washington State Preservation of Liberty Act, this week. It reads in part, that the indisputable threat of terrorism is real and the full force of appropriate constitutional law must be used to defend this threat. However, winning the war against terror cannot come at the great expense of eviscerating the unalienable rights recognized by and protected in the United States Constitution and the Constitution of the State of Washington. Indeed, undermining these constitutional rights only to concede to the terrorist demands of changing the fabric of what has made the U.S. A republic granting the greatest number of people the greatest amount of liberty, justice, security, opportunity, prosperity, happiness, peace, and good ever known or experienced by humankind throughout the world. Uh, and of course, that's all well and good, but I think we do have to get honest about the real terrorist threat. It's so much of the manufactured hype about nonsense. All these cases have fallen through in court. If they weren't outright FBI provocateur all kinds of lies on 9-11 and more. So I want to challenge politicians that while it's great to stand up against the powers of the NDAA, somebody has to come clean and get honest about this whole damn system. Something to keep an eye on there. Meanwhile, the Ron Paul campaign headquarters were attacked in Washington State. We have a short clip of that now. Candidate Ron Paul's Washington State headquarters were attacked last night. Staff and volunteers were there as someone started throwing rocks. Nobody was hurt, but two volunteers felt the glass shatter as objects came through the windows. Police are investigating that. 
And that being yet another caucus state where Ron Paul's ground support threatens to capture more delegates in the GO primary, even as the GOP establishment wants to hurriedly annoy Mitt Romney and keep Gingrich up there as a distraction. Now, there was another case a couple days ago in Florida, just ahead of that vote. Everyone step on his toes. Gingrich security harasses Ron Paul supporter. And it goes on to explain how Dillard, a Ron Paul supporter in his late 20s, uh, showed up with a sign and found himself surrounded by Gingrich's little press corps and where they were doing a stop. And Gingrich's own aides and security personnel started stepping on his toes, tried to intimidate him out of the area, and told everyone basically to get him. And uh, he now has a broken foot or a fractured foot and other injuries and bruises just for holding up a Ron Paul sign in front of his lordship Gingrich. Now the Ron Paul campaign is demanding an apology from Gingrich and even suggesting that Gingrich should pay for the medical bills of Dillard, uh, who does have a fractured foot, according to reports. So just all kinds of nasty attacks on the Ron Paul campaign, even as he supposedly can't win and but he's winning the hearts and minds and trying to change the whole discourse over what it means to elect a puppet president and what direction our country is headed. Meanwhile, the family of slain border agent Brian Terry is now suing uh, over the wrongful death against the federal government. Terry was killed December 14, 2010 by drug cartel bandits in Arizona. They found two AK-47s at the scene, later linked to the government's own Fast and Furious gun running operation. Of course, uh, as part of that wrongful death lawsuit, there will be a great amount of disclosure that is at least possible if they don't obscure the investigation. As the family seeks justice, they complain, among other things, that they were lied to in their face shortly after his death by various federal agencies. Uh, and that's plenty disgusting. Of course, Kurt Nemo does the background homework on there, too, connecting the CIA's own involvement, according to the Washington Times, the mainstream press, in that larger Fast and Furious case. The agency helped arm the Sinaloa cartel, described in the Washington Times article as the, quote, preferred cartel on the street level near the American border. Of course, Wachovia Bank and others have been caught laundering massive amounts of money for the Sinaloa cartel, all tied in to that small case around Brian Terry, which is part of the larger Fast and Furious scandal. And we'll see how that all turns out. Meanwhile, San Onofre reactor offline for leak as it's investigated. That is near San Diego, an extremely small NBC LA emphasizes amount of radiation could have escaped from the San Onofre nuclear generating station near San Diego a week, uh, after a water leak prompted operators to shut down the reactor, according to officials. An extremely small amount of radiation. Where have we heard these lies before? Meanwhile, only days ago, January 30th, Illinois' nuclear reactor loses power, venting steam in Byron, Illinois. Excelon Nuclear says a reactor at its Byron generating station has been shut down after losing power, and steam is being vented to reduce pressure. However, they say the steam contains low levels of tritium, which is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen, but not at unsafe levels. Everything's safe, they keep reminding you. We heard this all before at Fukushima for months. They denied anything was happening. Then you saw the head of TEPCO, the prime minister of Japan, all weeping on television, sorry that they had lied to their own people and the whole world about the grossly dangerous levels of radiation. Now let's look back to an AP report from uh, uh, six or seven months ago in the summer, June 21st, 2011, in Illinois, right next to the Byron, uh, excuse me, the Byron, Illinois nuclear reactor, where they discuss how tritium is being leaked. Tritium, which is a radioactive form of hydrogen, has leaked from at least 48 of 65 sites, according to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and their records. Leaks from at least 37 of those facilities contain concentrations exceeding the federal drinking water standard, sometimes at hundreds of times the limit. And then look at the caption over here in the story. Uh, you can see it on screen as well as behind me here. That, uh, let's see, more than six million gallons of tritium laden water in repeated leaks dating back to the 1990s, exist, but were not publicly reported until 2005. But don't worry, uh, the AP and NBC LA have told you the levels are safe. There's nothing to worry about. 
just like at Fukushima. So, and we have a worldwide headline on that too, including the leaks in France and other parts of the country here in the U.S. and other parts across the world. It's just going on everywhere. It doesn't have something to do with Dr. Busby connecting the radiation levels with infertility. I don't know. Time will tell, but will it be too late then? And will officials warn people not to live next to nuclear reactors, or will they keep telling them how safe it is and how it's no big deal? It's basically the same as not living next to a nuclear reactor. Hmm. Now, the same people who are telling you these kinds of lies about radiation are essentially the same basic regulatory agencies who tell you GMO foods are safe or that aspartame is safe for consumption. And now there's a new false debate. Should the government regulate sugar just like it regulates alcohol and tobacco? Yeah, well, the short answer is no. Obviously, sugar is very dangerous, connected with a number of diseases, a number of bad conditions in our uh, American and worldwide culture, and obviously overconsumption of sugar is a major problem here. But here on the own CBS News report, 68% uh, of people said no, they don't want the government to regulate. 32, though, are okay with the regulation. So maybe they figure they have some uh, public support to move forward. Uh, but the whole idea here is that the FDA approved aspartame, even though countless studies showed it was dangerous. The FDA uh, has streamlined and created new positions in its own agency, bringing on people who worked for Monsanto, including Michael Taylor, to rapidly approve and fast-track the approval of all kinds of GMOs from Monsanto and the other genetically modified producers and get them on the market, always telling you it's safe. Is it? These are the people who are going to regulate sugar? Yeah, we need to eat less sugar. We need to have a whole cultural discussion about that. I've been unhealthy myself. I've tried to make changes, and among those changes are cutting back my sugar exposure, but we can't do it at the federal regulation level. That's only going to cause more problems, probably a black market for sugar. These aren't the kind of solutions we want, and we cannot trust the FDA, who just a few days ago was caught uh, essentially uh, trying to target their own whistleblowers from within the FDA when they were trying to warn about, uh, what was it, a heart device that what they believed was unsafe. They spied on and then tried to persecute their own employees when they tried to blow the whistle on the unsafe things being approved at the FDA. Somebody's got to rein in that power. Uh, but in other news, Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, I think more than a year ago, gave a speech at the Montreal, Canada branch of the CFR warning that a widespread global awakening was taking place. And we're going to play that clip right now, but he has not backed off from that statement. First time in all of human history, mankind is politically awakened. That's a total new reality. Total new reality. It has not been so for most of human history until the last 100 years. And in the course of the last 100 years, the whole world has become politically awakened. And no matter where you go, politics is a matter of social engagement. And most people know what is generally going on, generally going on in the world, and are consciously aware of global iniquities, inequalities, lack of respect, exploitation. Mankind is now politically awakened and stirring. The combination of the two, a diversified global leadership, politically awakened masses, makes a much more difficult context for any major power, including currently the leading world power, the United States. So humanity is awake and staring, as the big news Brzezinski puts it, and the elite are concerned about this. They're dealing with it. If you're new to the big new Brzezinski or this broadcast, he was the former national security advisor under Carter, and he's one of the true geostrategic visionaries for the elite. Uh, he, like others, works towards the one world government. Uh, in the 70s, he covertly helped put the Taliban into power to oppose the Soviets, and he has this whole long game for the grand chessboard, as he calls it, and, and how the American superpower is going to stave off Russia and China. But he's admitted uh, that basically is failing. There are new emerging world powers, India, Brazil, China, Russia, among others. And though those powers are themselves changing America's hegemony over the world, uh, the British Anglo-American Empire, 
Empire and the other players in NATO and so forth. And that's all part of his new book, Strategic Vision. And we've got an excerpt here from it where he continues to talk about the awakening of humanity as a major factor. Indeed, the changing distribution of global power and the new phenomenon of massive political awakening intensify, each in its own way, the volatility of contemporary international relations. Uh, that's a excerpt from his intro, as is this quote. Uh, with the foregoing in mind, this book seeks to respond to four major questions. So he's got four major questions in this book. And number one of these major questions is what are the implications of the changing distribution of global power from west to east and how is it being affected by the new reality of politically awakened humanity? Now, what are we really talking about here? What are the elite concerned about when we talk about this global political awakening of humanity? We're talking about people who are aware of their covert hidden agenda for a one world order. Uh, people have been talking about this for decades, since the 50s. Uh, the roots of it are even deeper. But now, thanks to the flow of information, thanks to the internet, a lot of people are awakened to it. These elitists are being confronted everywhere. And this really is and always has been an information war. The only difference is in the past hundreds of years, the past thousands of years, it's always been the tiny niches of royalty, of kingships, of priest classes who held most of the important knowledge. Uh, literacy was kept down amongst the masses uh, in relation to this reason. But now we have worldwide literacy, even though a lot of people are pissing that away and it's very sad. And that literacy comes at a time when we have this global internet age. We have a short window of time when a lot of people have the chance to know what's really going on with these global elites, see their power for what it is, and uh, if we can, seek to change the dimensions of those power. Now, of course, other foreign powers, China, Russia, uh, they're not the friends of humanity either. They're on the chessboard, though, and it's going to be important what decisions they make as well. Let's play a clip from Hillary Clinton admitting that they're losing the info war. We are engaged in an information war. You know, during the Cold War, we did a great job in getting America's message out. After the Berlin Wall fell, we said, okay, fine, enough of that. You know, we've done it, we're done. Um, and unfortunately, we are paying a big price for it. And our, our private media cannot fill that gap. In fact, our private media, particularly cultural programming, often works at counter purposes to what we truly are as Americans and what our values are. I remember we, we are in an information war and we are losing that war. I'll be very blunt in my assessment. Al Jazeera is winning. The Chinese have opened up a global English language and multi-language television network. The Russians have opened up an English language network. Now, she's talking on the one hand about foreign press and the whole U.S. Uh, strategy to put out propaganda and try to influence people around the world. That's all important, but it also has to do with this information war taking place with individuals in the age of the internet. And that too is what the info war is really all about. So I want to encourage everyone out there who's already recognized the info war not to give up. We're having a huge effect. Truth is on our side. Truth is more important than ever. And how ironic is it that as the mainstream media dies, as these dinosaur outlets and newspapers and, and the mainstream networks are dying off and losing their influence, that these new foreign networks are also featuring patriots speaking the truth, also speak, uh, featuring so-called conspiracy theorists, trying to tell it like it really is. Why does Al Jazeera uh, have gaining influence? Because the U.S. and the Western forces are so full of lies on the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war. It doesn't really matter how credible Al Jazeera is. All they have to do is point out all the horrible things going on in these wars and the other provocations and the undermining of foreign policy. Uh, those are the kind of issues that we're dealing with here, and I just want to encourage you to stay on the side of truth. With that in mind, we have a quote of the day. It's from George Orwell. You probably already know it, but it's worth keeping in mind. In a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And that's, of course, uh, George Orwell, author of 1984, real name Eric Blair. He himself, a Fabian socialist, but a disgruntled Fabian socialist who sought to expose them. Now, we have Jerome Corsi coming up on the other side of the break, but I want to tell you now, Alex is going on tour. He's going to speak at the Lakewood Theater in Dallas Sunday, February 19th, and then he's going to speak in Orlando, Florida at the uh, 
Ja Ale. I have no idea if I'm saying that right, but it's up on the website. It's Sunday, February 26th, and we have a great promo that was put together by Rob Jacobson. We're going to play it here in the break and come back with Jerome Corsi. Stay tuned. Greetings, fellow Info Warriors. Alex Jones here announcing the first of many trips that I'm going to take across this wonderful United States that we live in. And we get so busy here at InfoWars.com, the nightly news, the daily radio show, the documentary films, and all the other things we're doing that I tend to never go out and give speeches anymore. And I've got a lot of ideas bubbling around in my head about the history of the New World Order, what makes them tick and how to defeat them. So I'm titling this key speech I'm going to give. It'll run around two hours long, Blueprint to Defeat the New World Order. And we're also going to have a surprise premiere of a short documentary film we've been working on at the event. First off, I'm going to be going to Dallas, Texas, Sunday, February 19th, 2012, to the historic Lakewood Theater. And the next Sunday, February 26th, I'm going to be in Orlando, Florida. You can find out more about the events and buy tickets at infowars.com forward slash events. Now, unfortunately, every event I've ever had, we've had to turn people away. So get your tickets early at infowars.com forward slash events. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this world. And the craziest of all is this explosive awakening. I can't wait to meet you and shake your hand. I'll see you in Dallas and I'll see you in Orlando. Infowars.com forward slash events. Sign of these evil 1770 six flags. Doesn't get any more out of control than that, ladies and gentlemen. It's pretty un American what we're doing here at InfoWars.com. I mean, not only are we promoting liberty, but we're selling 1776 flags. Now that is Al Qaeda. We are back from break. We're joined now by Dr. Jerome Corsi. Uh, he's got a PhD from Harvard. He's been the author of Unfit for Command, the Swift Boat book against John Kerry, and a whole lot more, including a North American Union book and so much other coverage. Thank you for joining us, doctor. A great pleasure to be back with you. Thank you. Now, you told us you've got a breaking story today uh, just on money laundering and big Wall Street scandal stuff. Why don't you break it down for us? I said the very top story at WND.com, the Skyline story. Uh, it, there's a whistleblower that's contacted WND I've been working with out of HSBC Bank, which is one of the biggest banks in the world. And this whistleblower has brought a thousand pages of internal bank documents, which show a multi billion, probably trillion dollar scheme to money launder through the bank with the obvious compliance and knowledge of senior management. It's, it looks like the bank has become a criminal, I mean, it's like a criminal operation being run internally in the bank. The wire, the wire transfers coming into and out of accounts show millions of dollars of activity in accounts that were established through identity theft. Mm -hmm. Evidently what the bank has done is they've stolen the legitimate um, names and social security numbers of people who don't, don't even know their names are being used to have accounts established at HSBC and then millions of dollars run through these accounts in money laundering. It, it's an incredible scandal. And we have a thousand pages of the internal bank do documentation that John Cruz, the whistleblower, took with him when he was basically fired from the bank for trying to get the bank's attention to this scandal. And you were talking uh, yesterday with Alex about all the money laundering from the drug gangs. All that right. stuff has been through banks like Wachovia by the hundreds of millions, if not billions. Well, I see this is the thing. I mean, if you think about it for a minute, the drug business and the drug cartel in Mexico, let's say they do $2 trillion in revenue annually. I mean, you know how heavy $2 trillion is in $100 bills? <laughs> it, it, it's worthless. It has to get into the banking system, and the banks provide a vehicle for it. 
Then the federal government comes along. When they catch a bank like HSBC, they give them a fine. Well, these major banks have $2 billion reserved just to pay fines. As long as the bank is not considered a criminal bank and nobody goes to jail, the fine is just a cost of doing business, and they go on their merry way laundering trillions of dollars of business around the world illegally. We've got such widespread corruption with Wall Street, a lot of anger, obviously, at Wall Street, but there's a big crony capitalism problem, too, based in the Washington and the leadership there. What do you see as the guiding light to sort of reforming the larger scandal with the housing collapse and, and everything going on? How, do we, how are we ever going to get out of this mess, doctor? Well, I think we need to be, you know, first of all, get down to the honesty of it. I mean, a good idea just to be fire everybody in Washington, reduce the size of the federal government, the corruption coming through the federal government. Anybody doesn't think this is government managed and government complicit is crazy. I'm sure we, by the time we get down to this, the bottom of these money launder scandals that I'm investigating, it's not only going to be drug money and terrorist money, I'm sure we're going to find part of the stimulus money going into money laundering. I mean, if they got eight, 700 or $800 billion in stimulus money, I'm sure the politicians in Washington get a high level, and the cronies setting up these fake Solyndra energy businesses can find a way to take 10% of that and skim it off through money laundering and pocket it. That's the problem. There's so much money with trillions of dollars of deficits. We're so awash in money that we've set up an, an invitation for criminals in the government and banks to participate to have a field day and enrich themselves in the process. Sure. And then... Uh, See, the, the key realization is we're not in this global crisis by accident. The globalists, the, the banks, the, you know, the, the government leaders, sure, borrow trillions. What difference does it make? They're never going to repay it. And while they're borrowing it, they can be stealing it. They can be running programs of giveaways. The giveaways, you know, when you take a look at the money on the border, $2 trillion in the drug trade, the, the idea is to keep it open so the banks can continue to launder the money. The illegal immigrants are a detail. Nobody really cares about them. Right. They're just kind of incidental to the whole operation, which is really about the drug war. Keep the border open so the drug war can flow and the good times can roll in the banks. Sure. Uh, isn't it in the larger picture a game of musical chairs to use the increasingly worthless money until the music stops and, and buy up real assets and, and for those in, in power to position themselves? Right. In the meantime, the middle class gets destroyed. Everybody who believes in the values of government is trying to live an honest life is in a diminished capacity. And the thieves are having a field day. And when the currencies collapse... The ones that will be having any wealth at all will still be the thieves. And then, like in the Depression, they'll run around and buy the hard assets that are left, re ante and do it all over again. But when I wrote America for Sale, I warned people that this globalism is a scheme devised by the globalists to further enrich the banks and the globalists. And the government officials that play along are going to get enriched in the process. Uh, now, switching gears, Dr. Corsi, obviously there's a lot of cynicism towards the elections in general. We always seem to get the lesser of two evils to choose from. But an even bigger question, is Obama even eligible? Obviously, that's been a huge question in your work. But now we've got the Georgia judge, uh, I believe he's about to rule within a day, a day or two's time on whether or not Obama has proven himself eligible. He didn't show up for the hearing. And that could spread, as you mentioned before, to other states. Where do you see that going? Well, I think it's going to be a 50-state challenge, state by state. Uh, the administrative law judge in Georgia has very little time to make the, the, the decision. Uh, the Georgia primary, Democratic primary, I believe, is on March 6th, and the ballots have to be printed or reprinted if Obama's name is going to be taken off the Democratic primary ballot. And the president, the attorney, didn't show up. The judge indicated he was ready to do a default judgment. Uh, clearly... The judge has already said he, there was going to be no uh, motion to dismiss the procedure that the president had made such a motion. The judge refused to grant it, saying that the laws that the president cited were not controlling. And that's very bad news for the White House because what it kind of telegraphs is that the, this judge may be going more in the direction of Minor v. Happersett, requiring natural-born citizens to be eligible to be president to have two U.S citizen parents at birth and 
born in the United States, and Barack Obama probably is disqualified on both counts. His father was Kenyan, never a U.S. citizen. Um, the, the arguments were made at the court that the birth certificate's a fraud, fraud a forgery. And uh, in Indonesia, Obama may also have lost his natural-born citizenship status. He was Barry Satoro officially, Barry Soribarka, when his mother removed him from her passport. How can a person have an Indonesian surname and still be a natural-born U.S. citizen? It's not possible. Right. And so, obviously, this should have been dealt with before Barack Obama ran the first time. But yes. now that he's running the second time, if uh, people do accept the idea that he's not eligible, what kind of crisis of confidence is this going to create? What, what's going to happen to our entire country? Well, first of all, it may be, I mean, I think it clearly is going to be a major detriment to Obama getting reelected. If one state fights and keeps Obama off the ballot, how's he going to win presidency of Georgia or several other states along with Georgia say to Obama, you're not going to be on the ballot, you're not a natural born citizen? Problem's not going away. It might even get it to the point where there's a constitutional crisis and his current presidency is questionable whether he's a usurper. But remember, we've also got Sheriff Arpaio conducting a law enforcement investigation in Maricopa County in Arizona for the, the Tea Party residents who have asked and petitioned that Sheriff look into whether Obama's eligible to be president. And that report is going to come out in at the end of February. Now, Sheriff Arpaio is doing the first law enforcement investigation. It's a very serious, very professional investigation. And I think that the president ought to be deeply concerned what the results are going to be. The sheriff has already said some of the results are going to be shocking. Well, uh, let's hold the sheriff at his word. And again, we'll have the results there. And the issue is unlikely to go away, going to continue to be debated. And a law enforcement determination is going to have to make some impact on millions of Americans. Mm. Yeah, it's outrageous. Uh, so where do you see the final direction going? Uh, they're building up for war in Iran. The economic crisis continues. Uh, where are we going in general, doctor? Well, I think we're headed to some major crises. I think uh, it's not clear today whether the EU is going to be able to get a new refinancing in place for Greece. Greece today says it needs $20 billion more. I mean, the truth is Greece is bankrupt. It's got a social welfare state. They're paying out entitlement benefits they can't afford. And Germany's going to have to cover Greece, which I don't think is going to happen. Iran and uh, Israel, Israel even today is again saying, making statements that all of the nuclear facilities in Iran could be hit by a preemptive Israeli <laughs> military strike. This is the first time Israeli officials have been making statements like this. And I think it again telegraphs that a real shooting war is about to start in the Middle East. I think the covert war, the secret war with Israel and Iran has already started. These assassinations of uh, Iranian nuclear scientists, the explosions in Iranian nuclear facilities, uh, the hands of Israeli intelligence and probably U.S. intelligence are all over those kinds of operations. I think the war's already begun. Certainly. Have you seen the Brookings uh, Institute report, Which Path to Persia, where they discuss everything from a velvet color revolution to another false flag, as well as economic sanctions and other means to start that war? Well, I think the, yes, I have. And I think the, the best path, the one I've you know, been fighting for since I wrote Atomic Iran in 2005, was for peaceful change from within. And we had the opportunity for that. If you remember, in June, June, I believe it was 2009, when the presidential election was held in Iran, the velvet, you know, you had all the, it was a green revolution, you had all the Iranians in the streets protesting. All Obama had to do was say that he supported the people in the streets to get freedom and a change of government. Obama didn't do it, and we lost a huge opportunity. I think a war is going to be disastrous. I've been against a war. Remind people, it's not, you know, it's not an electronics game here. There's going to be thousands of people killed. The war is unpredictable. It could lead to a regional war. It could be nuclear in scope. I've been praying and doing everything I can writing to try to convince people that a war is the worst solution. And the Iranians, you know, I walked 200 miles with the Iranian freedom fighters in the United States 
in two, after I wrote the book in 2005, calling for freedom in Iran. The Iranian people want freedom. We have no problem with the Iranian people. It's this Iranian government that is a group of radical religious zealots that in fact are going to pursue a nuclear weapon and will not be stopped by sanctions or negotiations. Uh, when the world comes to recognize that, war is still not the only solution. And I, I pray that we can be more intelligent and support the people within Iran who want to change their own government from within. We don't need to do it for them. We shouldn't do it. We shouldn't be involved. But in a war, it's going to involve, I think, regionally, the United States almost immediately, and it has the potential of becoming a war that could escalate out of control. Doctor, looking back over the past year, what does it say about the U.S. and the NATO allied forces that in fighting Libya and now look like in fighting Syria, we've allied with al-Qaeda forces, actual members of al-Qaeda? Well, I've been writing about this in, in, in WND and objecting to it. The, the, this was all billed as the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Arabian Spring. You know, this all the, like it was a burst of freedom in the region. Uh, Obama knew what he was doing. This was a move to radicalize the Middle East. The winners were the Islamic Brotherhood, the Muslim Brotherhood, which you couldn't, there's not a more radical force in the Middle East. This is a force that today we're seeing controlling a, a military dictatorship. It's going to be in, in Egypt. Americans are going to have to get out. Uh, it's not going to be democracy. The Muslim Brotherhood controls the voting, votes in a much higher proportion, wins control of the government, and stops elections. We've just seen a radicalizing of the Middle East, and it's going on country by country by country. You know, Assad in Syria is being again besieged by the mother, Muslim Brotherhood forces. And I mean, Assad w was a dictator and no gem, an ally with Iran, but what's coming into Syria is probably going to be worse. And Obama, again, mm -hmm. either knowingly participated in engineering this or didn't understand it, which I don't believe, and didn't take the steps necessary to be on the right side. We've been on the wrong side consistently, uh, a side that, of forces that are not going to impose democracy and freedom in these countries throughout northern Africa and the Middle East, Syria, um, Libya, etc. But it's going to become a, a Muslim ra radical group of countries that will ally, even though they're Sunnis, will ally with Iran and cause the Middle East to be a much more dangerous region for everyone. Now, uh, in closing, and, and feel free to add any other topics you want to bring up, to what extent are we being driven by the Western foreign policy wonks who've wanted a, a clash of cultures and, and who in many senses are building up an artificial extremism in the Middle East to build up an enemy? Well, I think there's a good deal of that. And I also put it squarely at the globalists on both sides, you know, the Henry Kissingers and the Zygmunt Brzezinski's, who had this grand idea of causing all these crises in order to gain more power. You know, the EU and the euro collapses, well, advance the International Monetary Fund in a global currency. That's been the plan. I think it's going to fail miserably. But the, the tragedy is that the world is going to go through a period of economic depression and wars that could be a prelude to a, like, like World War I, World War II. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, there's going to be millions of people in economic misery, millions of people in warfare. This is a formula for having to send on the earth the kind of catastrophes economically and with governments and military conflicts that we haven't seen since World War II. And when I try to calculate the millions of people that died in World War II, what's coming could make World War II look like a minor event. That's what, that's what I fear. And what a shame, too. I mean, obviously, the muddy water is muddy on all sides of this issue. But most of all, I think we really don't want that larger war well, because it would be so the, devastating. The point is what I've been writing for so much to get to the, the truth that we get back, for instance, to the principles our founding fathers in the Constitution, go back to the Tenth Amendment, say to the federal government, we don't want to participate anymore. Mm -hmm. Government does not need to have greater power and to be aggrandized at a greater level. We need people to be in control of their own lives. We need the media to stop being a 
political media making millions of dollars telling the global story while all along the people are lied to and not given the truth. Uh, the Internet shows like Alex's are great resources, but we've got to get back to the, the fundamental reality that we, the people in the United States, are sovereign, not the government in Washington. And we'll leave it there for today. We look forward to future updates from you. Dr. Jerome Corsi, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Take care. And that's it for tonight's InfoWars Nightly News, but we do want to remind you of our specials. We're not corporate funded, we're not foundation funded, and we're trying to get out a message to stop uh, what they have designed. So with that in mind, we want to remind you we have 44% off of a yearly subscription right now. That ends on Friday, so take advantage of that offer now. And you can also take a 15-day free trial. Take a look for yourself. See if it's something you want to support. Uh, we're available on other platforms as well, but we do need your help getting that message out uh, so we can grow this mission. Thank you and good night.